Oh, hello. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. And I can't believe thank it. you, Victoria, for having me here. When you reached out to me, I was like, yeah, of course, I would love to chat with you and, and share with your community. This is a big pinch me moment for me because I you were actually on my um, vision board for 2023. I was like, I have to get Tina on the Glam Life podcast. And I remember telling my friends that and they're like, you'll be able to do it for sure. You'll be able to do it. And I was like, no, you don't understand. It's Tina Davies. <laughs> but OK, so if that was one of my biggest goals for 2023, what are we thinking is going to happen in 2024? My first prediction for 2024 is that I think by like March, people who are struggling with clients are going to pick up a little bit. What are you thinking? Um, that is all predicated upon the Fed and interest rates. Yeah. So who knows what they're doing with that? But they're already telegraphing like, hey, there's going to be some cuts, which means that people aren't going to be so stretched. And that yeah. has to has impacted us the most in 2023. I read, and I'm sure you've read this. People are like, I'm, I've never been this slow before. I've been yep. doing this for seven years. Like people are selling their, their, their stuff. <laughs> like they're leaving. Yeah. yeah. People are quitting. Yeah. Are you still taking, you're still taking clients. Are you? Well, I had a business in Toronto for 20 years. Yeah. Built that. I built it before social media and you know, all this stuff, like the good old fashioned way. And two years ago, we left Toronto because it was so incredibly strict with the COVID regulations. My kids were not in school and um, it really just came down to quality of life. And I think for a lot of people, they kind of reassessed what, what they wanted to do and where they were prioritizing themselves. And I pr prioritized that quality of life at that point. I decided to leave Toronto be able to move somewhere, Florida, to put my kids in school. Because if the yeah. kids aren't happy and not functional, the parents cannot do anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And like, I'm a working mom, you know, and it was so challenging for us. So we left Toronto, moved to Southeast Florida. And then um, when I made that decision, I had to give up my business. It was really hard because I built that from scratch. I mean, I've got clients for... 15, 20 years that I've seen yeah. like 15 times. But I was like, you know what? I'm going to pass you guys off to others that can help you. And so when I moved to Florida, my choices were, do I want to rebuild again? And you know, I, I love right. that part of the business. I love tattooing. It's my first love. I get to be an artist, be create, make people happy. But to tattoo again, I'd have to rebuild that from scratch and decided to just focus on the product side. Okay. The product side I've been building now for nine years. Yeah. So focus on the product side. I've got 20 team members and I didn't even know how I did it before, but I was tattooing. I was working on the product side and I was also like doing the mom thing. You know, it's yeah. like, I'm like there. I end up doing three things poorly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So long story short, no, I'm not tattooing actively anymore, but I still tattoo to work on friends, family models, especially when I have new products, I right. test them out and, you know, record results and whatnot. But I do have like a, an amazing pro team and, you know, just people that I know in the industry that give me lots of feedback. And to be honest with you, they are better at it than me. <laughs> they are just, you know, just so much better. I've seen the industry like, oh, wow, the art has leveled up in the past year massively. Yeah. I feel like all these people had so much time to practice when they were sitting around in 2020 that now they've put that into practice and they have their healed results to show after 2021 and 22. And we're starting to really see a resurgence of art in permanent artists. I so love with social media. You're able to see what people are doing in Thailand, what new techniques yeah. are doing in Russia. You're like, whoa, that is mind blowing. I'm going to go and just start doing that tomorrow. Yeah. I mean, it, people try, right? But then all of a sudden you're doing these little pixel brows that, you know, you found out about just yesterday on Instagram. It's so funny. It's so true though. I had a, a student come in for, I teach monthly fundamentals. I had a student come in for that class and she was saying, yeah, I'm going to finish this class. I have some cousins who live over in Russia. And I was thinking, you know, I'll go and stay with them. I'm going to bring this to Russia and blah, blah, blah. I was just thinking to myself like, girl, 
<laughs> I don't mean to laugh at you, but <laughs> you're going to go and teach Russians what you learn in this one fundamentals class. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a break. Have you opened Instagram? They're way better than us. They're way better than us. <laughs> that really tickled me. I like what you said, though. I just want to step back for a second before we move on. I like what you said about like, if the kids aren't happy, then mom and dad can't focus on anything else. And first of all, I think that a lot of us who are working moms found that in 2020, when we were all closed, we were like, how am I supposed to run a business and be a mom and the kids are here full time and the business is struggling. Like, how am I supposed to even like spring break? It's like, what, what are we yeah. going to do with them for a week? They're pulling at my pants. We're doing it right now. We're closed. All the schools are closed for Christmas. We are closed. I came in just for you, which of course I would always do, <laughs> but yeah, I just told my kids like they're playing. I'm like, do not bother mommy for one hour. Don't ask me for anything. Don't let the dog run around. Don't, you know, ask me for an iPad. No. <laughs> <laughs> Can you fix me a sandwich? I'm taking a bath. <laughs> like it's it's all the time. So yeah. I feel that. But you you've always lived this life, right? Because your parents were entrepreneurs. Yeah. So do you feel like this was just something that's just kind of ingrained in who you are? You know what? I fought it for a long time. Because okay, I was raised by immigrant parents. Yeah. My family always had. As immigrants, you come over to a country, you can't be like, oh, here's my degree in such and such. They're like, yeah, well, we have, you know, degrees here too. And you guys don't speak English. So immigrants are forced to make things work. They basically will open up, you know, uh, sh little shops, little restaurants, things like that. So I came from an immigrant family and what my, my, some, my after school and my summers were spent at the shop, whether it's a restaurant, a retail store. I grew up in a restaurant. I grew up in a jewelry store. Um, I, I grew up that way. And I thought to myself, like, I don't want my kids to have that because that's, they don't get it to have a childhood. My childhood was, you know, at the shop. Summer was yeah. at the shop. I didn't know what summer camp is. I didn't even know that these programs for kids that they actually go and they spend a whole summer at a sleepaway camp. <laughs> like that's luxurious and expensive. Like my parents were saving yogurt cups. Like, oh, Tina, what are you having for lunch? You're having yogurt for lunch? I'm no, no, no. I'm eating this minced pork. But they <laughs> think it's yogurt because, you know, they're saving every penny they have, right? So yeah. used to that mentality. And I first I was embarrassed because like, oh God, you know, here we are again. Like I'm not going to do this fancy. I'm not going on ski trips with my family. I'm going to the shop. And so I fought it for a long time that I didn't want my kids to have that. So I'd be putting them into the camps. I'd be doing these things called play dates. I didn't even know that kids need play dates. I would just play, like go across the street and play. Yeah. Yeah. But modern day parenting is like, you got to arrange play dates. That so feels I, very Californian to me. We don't do that here. We just go across the street and our kids play with each other. It's a, definitely a city thing. It's a city thing. Got to be. Yeah. Yeah. Like you have to arrange the dates and, and stuff like that. So um, I fought it for a long time because I really I thought, OK, that I don't want them to be like me where I had to spend my hours doing all these like chores and tag along with my parents. So I put I did all these play dates, I put my kids in all these programs. And like, to be honest with you, they hated them. They hated to be scheduled all the time. They hated that. No, that's oh, a, that's doing, a like, real thing. You know, art class and then yeah. piano and then soccer and, you know, all this stuff because I had to keep them busy. So I was like, you know what? Forget that. I'm just going to fold them into my business. And it turns out they love it much more. They're learning something. We're together. And the last time that I saw you at Wulop, you, you met my daughter. She yeah, was on that's the what stage. I was gonna... <laughs> she was around the booth. She loves it. That's actually, I was thinking to myself when you first said, like, I didn't want that for my kids. I was thinking, well, something changed because that's how we met. So yeah. everyone listening, Tina and I actually met at Woolot because I was a vendor with Brow Sister. Tina was there as a judge. And her daughter, you were a judge, right? Yeah. And her daughter, Brooke, was attracted, I think, just to my branding because it's very pink, very fun looking. Barbie. And, yeah. Listen, Brooke and Danny took up residence at my at my stand and we all hung out for quite some time. Brooke knows more about business than I have ever learned in any class from any mentor. Brooke was like, this is what I think you should do. Why don't you do like that? Brooke was bringing people to my stand saying, you have to try this numbing. It's the best numbing I've ever had. And at one point, did I tell you this? How she asked for a sample? 
Oh, really? No. I don't so know she that. asked me, I had these cute little samples. They're like maybe half an inch or an inch tall. And they have a cute little wrap around them. She said, can I have one of your samples? And I said, oh, sure. Wait. No, you can't. Because I don't think I should give lidocaine to a minor. And Brooke said, probably not. I said, okay, well, sorry about that. You know, she trots off to go and, I don't know, shoot her money gun or whatever. And she comes back a little while later and she said, actually, can I have a sample? It's for my mom. And I said, no. And she said, no, it's really for my mom. It's not for me. It's for my mom. I said, sweetie, that's worse. (laughs) I said, I can't, I can't give Tina Davies a sample of my numbing. Are you kidding? I'm having a hot flash. Like, I don't even know your mom. She's like, well, I'll bring her by. (laughs) <laughs> and that's how <laughs> Tina and I met. But I was lit. I told you before we jumped on the call, like my insurance calls and I get the sweats. So Tina Davies getting a sample of a product she didn't even ask for. Hell no, absolutely not. But Brooke was like, it's just Tuesday. You know, she was like, yeah, sure. We're not. Why wouldn't you? <laughs> she knows so much about business and she's so comfortable in that environment. And I asked her, are you going to be a permanent makeup artist when you get older? I said, is that what you want to do? You want to be like your mom and work in permanent makeup? And she said, no, I'll probably run a company. And I said, yes, you probably will. You probably will. She's already got it all hooked up where she's got a booth at PMU World Live. Oh, yes, yes. And I'm like, okay, great. Maybe I'll just tag along in your booth. I'll just work for you. What's she she's selling? Got her branding established. She's got her raw her her inventory and stuff she's made all these bracelets okay yeah (laughs) I thought for sure it would be slime because she was really pushing hard for me to incorporate slime into my branding (laughs) (laughs) she was very certain I needed to put it in this one little area you know they have the um the little pop-up stands that go on your table Mm -hmm. there's a little triangle empty space holding it up She, she I needed to have slime in there she was certain about it she was like they have perfect ones in the gift shop here so I, I just assumed she might be making slime or something. Maybe she wants to sell me slime. I encourage their ideas. And like, if it doesn't work out, let's switch gears. Whatever. Hey, listen, at eight years old, she's eight or nine. How old is she? Eight. At eight years old, you can have as many ideas flop as you want. You're still leagues ahead of me. So go off. Go. Good for you, Brooke. <laughs> Absolutely. I had a million failed businesses, by the way. Before I started permanent makeup, I was, well, obviously I've talked about this at length. I was a dancer all through college. Um, Then I had a job with my college degree and that wasn't for me, a nonprofit, a trident name. I was a seamstress. I used to um, hem and take in dresses and that kind of thing. I worked at a daycare. I, I'm missing one. I'm missing a big one. Oh, I was a birth coach. I was a doula. And I attended 11 births, 12 babies. One was twins, all boys. So I was very certain God was saving all the girls for me. I was going to have nothing but daughters. And just every time I get pregnant, penises, penises everywhere. I don't, I'm not supposed to be. It's a boy. It's a boy. Over and over and over. I've been pregnant four times. I have two sons, but it was a boy every time. Fairly certain. I, I just feel like every time that I failed in business, I learned something about that business. I learned something from that business, from that failure. And that's why I've been able to do things pretty quickly on a trajectory of opening up a new business. Even with permanent makeup, I stumbled a few times before finding my footing with that. And then when I started Brow Sister, I had two or three stumbles there. You have a massive company. So you've done this on a, on a gigantic international scale. Did it start that way? Did it start off like, oh, we're going to be really popular. We're going to be really famous. We're taking this international. No, it started literally. I saw, I went to a conference in Florida, Nouveau Contour. I don't even know if you've heard yeah. of this. Yeah. You yeah. know this brand? Okay. This we is OG the brand, okay? This is OG brand. I went to a conference. There was a man doing a demonstration there and he was able to make hair strokes on eyebrow with a needle on a stick, like a wooden stick. I was floored because I had never seen that. And I had been doing eyebrows at that time for like, I don't know, almost a decade with like a machine and a needle. But he yeah. was like, he just drew it like this and he cut them into the skin. And this is something called embroidery. I, I don't know if you heard it. It's called embroidery from China. Yeah. And I was like, wow, I was so floored. And I was like, this is the next best thing since sliced bread. So I decided that, hey, you know what? I want to team up with my mentor, Linda Dixon, who is the founder of 
you know, all the most popular anesthetics, uh, tag 45, ultra duration and whatnot. So we said, hey, let's teach a class on how to do this because this is so cool. And then so I started to look at the little needle on a stick and this really small needle set. I'm like, you know what? Why don't I just call it a microblade? And then we'll teach a microblading class. And that's how I started with the concept of micro, but I didn't like the tool. It was like in this odd packaging, uh, kind of like smushed up paper and you had to assemble it together. It didn't seem like the type of professional product I would use because yeah. I, at that point I was, a, you know, established professional. So I would kind of uh, feel a little hesitant about using it, but whatever. It is a cool new technique. I want to try it. So um, we taught two classes, 60 people attended. Sheila Bellows there as well. Um, there's a, a lot of um, people that we know nowadays, uh, well-known people that, you know, started with microblading. And that's like microblading really blew up. It yeah. blew up because permanent makeup before was kind of like a, a weird, maybe, I want to say like senior citizen type of service. So yeah. it didn't look that good. It looked like blue eyebrows and whatnot. So microblading was um, the first new permanent makeup service like oh you can feather your eyebrows it looks so natural and it really blew up in the media and so it was like the perfect like you know um jump off point for permanent makeup because of the media and I decided you know what I don't like the tools I'm going to make a better I'm going to make a tool I'm going to make a microblade a disposable microblade that you're not reusing handles and whatnot and they look like weird little craft handles so that's how that's how I started it was literally a idea from maybe like maybe I can make some of this stuff and maybe somebody like me wants it because it was such a new service at the time so yeah. new I didn't even suspect that it would even get accepted but it blew up and so I had the first disposable microblade in the market and I had like many different sizes and the sizes just came from what I thought that I would need to execute thin thick different size eyebrows so it was um it was my first foray. And I remember we had like 300 of them and we, I introduced it at a, a show and I literally just had Brooke. Brooke was three months oh, old. And I was thinking my, now I look back, I'm like, what am I thinking? Who like at pregnant and Matley would think about developing a product line. So that was like 10 years ago, but it blew up and we could not keep them in stock. And so I just kept going with it. And as I, I'm a person of lots of ideas because I grew up in like my immigrant family's jewelry store. We made everything by hand. Um, we has resold a lot of jewelry as well. Let's say like, you know, ready-made earrings, but we did lots of custom pieces. So I've always been, uh, I like to make things, design things and whatnot. So designing things comes really naturally to me. And uh, that, that's like my creative part. Like I'll make my own clothes. I'll make my own <laughs> You know, it's things around the house. I, I like to make things. So it came really naturally to me. And then I just started making more and more products. That's yeah, exciting. That's how, how did the um how did the partnership with Permablend come about? Did they just approach you or did you already have kind of an idea that you wanted to start doing like the I Love Ink series? Did you already have an idea for that? Yeah, at that point I was five years into Tina Davies. So we had a lot of like game changing products. But one thing that was always a huge problem was the pigments yeah. because the pigments uh, for an artist, you can do great work, but if the color is changing, it looks like your work is crap. Yeah. So I had a lot of like pink eyebrows, salmon eyebrows, green eyebrows, purple eyebrows. I had clients literally with different colors because I had done them multiple times with different brands right? and they age and they look like rainbows in their eyebrows. So I was like, okay, I really need to fix this. I mean, yeah. I want to fix this. I'm not saying you <laughs> need to fix this, but I'd love to fix this with a new product. However, if I look in my industry, everything I've ever used has failed me. So I know, like, I need to look outside of my industry. There's some gatekeeping. There's just not enough information. There's so Colors. much gatekeeping. There's yeah, so, so much gatekeeping. A lot of gatekeeping. And it's, it's, it was just the, 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 the industry was not mature enough in pigments. The people that are formulating it and are that and that are selling it are two different people or two different right. entities. So there's not education to teach people how to use it. So you're just using brown that your trainer gave you. 
light brown, medium brown, dark brown, black. Yeah. That, that's what you used. And later you're like, oh my God, I got pink eyebrows. What do I do? And you don't know. And when you ask your manufacturer, they're like, never heard of this problem. You're like, no, oh, I've got a hundred cases. There's a problem. So I decided to look outside of my industry and had a colleague that had the same problem. She had 200 cases of green eyebrows. I had 200, 200 cases of green eyebrows. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. She's an industry vet. And she's like, and I digest that <laughs> 200, 200. So she was like, I, she had so much anxiety. She was stressed out. I the same, but I was not, I didn't have 200 cases. I had yeah. like some here and there, some salmon brows. And it was just very frustrating because if you're charging, I'm charging $900. I, I can't, I can't have clients, you know, having pink eyebrows. It's a lot right. of money. You expect a lot more. So I was like, okay, finally, I'm going to do something about this. And she said, Tina, I am starting to use tattoo ink. I bought this brand called World Famous at ah. a tattoo show. And I'm using tattoo ink to cover up the green eyebrows. And me and her were like, oh. Oh my God, tattoo ink. We were told always by permanent makeup companies never to use tattoo ink. It would cause cancer. It's uh, you call them and they don't support you. They tell you, uh, don't, don't call us. We don't use it around the eye. So like there was a lot of gatekeeping from the tattoo industry side that they didn't want you to use their inks. Yeah. They didn't want you to use their products. So, but, but she's like, look, I'm so desperate. I'm going to try it. And Tina, you should try it too. So we bought all these like world famous inks. Aren't they permanently? Per yes. <laughs> World Famous is the parent company of Permablend. Okay. For people that don't know that. Okay. So she started buying it and then it's like, okay, you know what? Let me, let me reach out to the owner. I'm a really like go to the top kind of person. Yeah. Not very Christian. I, I just want to know, like, I'll be like, Hey, what are you doing? What's going on? Tell me all about it. I'm a phone person. I'm not like a text person. Yeah. Cause then we can have a live conversation. Right. So I called up Lou. I'm like, Lou, hey, I'm Tina. You probably don't know me. I represent permanent makeup. This is my industry. Tell me about your stuff. So I asked him 20 million questions and he's just like, girl, come to my tattoo show. I showed up there. There was like 300 booths of artists tattooing. I got, I, I asked them a lot of questions like, hey, does that fade? Uh, tell me about this color. Like the artist would look at me like I've got two heads. Like, what do you mean? Does it fade? Does it change color? No, I give a tattoo of a dragon. It stays like this. People suffer for hours. I don't tell them to come up every year for a touch up. People suffer for hours. Yeah, like they have to go through the tattoo process. So their inks don't change color. They're extremely stable. Not with, with brow them. sister. Really? What's up? No, I said not with brow sister, you know, because numbing. Oh, yeah. The numbing. <laughs> Just joking. Yeah, but for body tattoo artists, I mean, these are the OG ink slayers. Listen, okay? that pain they is They make a... lines. They make, you know. That mural. is a badge for them. They love that. I've seen... Um... What's that white and black brand tattoo numbing something or other? I see it on my Facebook newsfeed. Mad and Rabbit? those, what is it called? Mad Rabbit? No, it, it okay. literally says tattoo numbing or numbing tattoo. It's like almost agnostic, but that's their brand name. The mm -hmm. comments are a bunch of people who get tattoos regularly saying, what pussies need this? Who wants to numb for a tattoo? So I can imagine these people when you walk in and say like, this fade. Does it change color? I can imagine using yeah. <laughs> like uh, you sound like what some kind of talking like about purpose. like you're insulting them. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You didn't get nervous? No. Unshakable. Tina Davies. <laughs> Wait, on, just can, I, can I interrupt you real quick and tell a quick anecdote that I don't know if you remember or not. I'm sure you do. Do you remember when I um, sexually harassed you at Woola? <laughs> No idea. I don't even remember like last week. What happened? <laughs> so, I got very drunk at the after party and very quickly because I don't drink. Right. And um, Lindsay of Lindsay and Jordan, who hang out with Danny all the time, you know, I, I do not. Michiana. How do you pronounce their company? Michiana. Name? Michiana. Michigan, Indiana, Michiana. Yeah. So she was sitting behind me and she actually videoed me and put it on her story. And she was like, this is what happens when you let moms out the house, out the kids. I'm like dancing in my seat. I'm drunk, whatever. So they finished their little awards program. You know, like you get this, you get that, whatever. That's a very small portion of it, maybe 20, 30 minutes. And then everybody lines up to come and take pictures at the big photo booth, which is right next to my table. 
And one of the organizers of the event, I don't remember which one it was, um, set her drink down very casually. Like, she, like I wasn't even there. She set her drink down in front of me and ran off to take a picture. So I downed her drink. And my husband was like, you just stole her drink. And I said, yeah, let's get out of here. So I set her drink back down. I think she noticed, like, I think she turned around and saw. And as we were running out, I was like, better cause a distraction. So I slapped you on the ass and you jumped in the air. <laughs> what did I do? You just did like that. <laughs> like okay, I it? ran out of the room laughing so loud the whole way to my room. And I was like, who do I think I am? I just grabbed Tina Davies. Ah. <laughs> well, you know what? I don't even Sorry. remember that. Maybe I had some drinks. <laughs> Sorry about that, Tina. <laughs> but yeah, you are not that board. bad at all because you know what? Like I didn't even remember. And if you did that, I would just laugh. Nerves of steel. This lady is unshakable. I fleeced her and she was just like, meh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a lot older than you. <laughs> well, not by much, but okay. So back to your story that I rudely interrupted. You went to this tattoo convention and you're asking people R and D, right? Does this fade? Does it change color? How does it go? And they're telling you like, you have three heads. What are you talking about? Of course it doesn't go. Okay. So then I'm like, okay, this is what the industry needs. We need colors that stay in without fading out a year, changing color. Um, we need products that are like uh, transparent too, right? Transparent with their ingredients. They're yeah. certified and whatnot. And, you know, mass market, they have mass market acceptance. So if tattoo artists are using it, this is probably going to be good enough. Okay. I don't want to work with or use products that are from like some mm -hmm. private label, some brand. I don't even know what they are, you know? Yeah. So I said to Lou, I said, Lou, will you make me a line for permanent makeup? And he's like, sure, no problem. And I was shocked because he was the first like tattoo company that I was able to talk to that didn't just hang up the phone. They were before there was like a lot of gaping. No, 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 go away. Don't ask us these stupid questions. You guys don't know what you're doing. You guys make little lines. We make murals. So he was like, yeah, no problem. Send, send me over your, your list of requirements and I'll work on it for, for you. So that's how it started. And like, we, we just really worked so good together, hand in hand. He's an entrepreneur. He's very visionary. He he believes in like breaking the mold, which, which is what I believe in as well. Like if it's not working, we got to switch gears. So yeah. that's how it started. And like permablend at the time was like, no one ever heard of permablend. So together, like I had to work with him to like tell a story, to introduce it to the permanent makeup market, because I'm not Tina Davies, the pigment maker, but let me leverage their expertise to then bring something better to the market. And like, people were just really surprised because they um never had inks that performed that well in the skin. That's that was crazy. a huge game changer from the for the whole industry. So you invented the term microblading. You popularized the tool itself and the technique. You taught some of the first people in the industry who then became like the OGs of microblading. And you inspired, if not demanded, that permablend be created. <laughs> like the industry owes Tina Davies so much more than they even realize, I think. Why don't you talk about this more often? You know, um, I've talked about it in the past, but I think not everyone gets, there's so many messages nowadays. You don't know where to, to get your information from. And it was these... very hard to find any info on you. So I usually research guests pretty well before I have them on. It was very difficult to find true interviews about Tina, the person more than just, Hey, these are Tina Davies pro pro team. These are her products. This is how you use her products. This is where you can meet her at this event or whatever. Your marketing is on point, but like the actual Tina, the person was very, I don't know your middle name. It was very hard for me to even find out your husband's name, which I mean, not to be a stalker, but just anything about you. <laughs> I wanted to make sure I didn't just ask you rant questions that you were like, everyone knows this. You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> I've got to share that more. I think it's just because I, I shared it a lot in the past, but then it's not current. And, uh, you know, people think that Tina Davies is like a brand. They don't actually know it's a person. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just an artist, just like you guys. I'm not, I might not be tattooing every day anymore, but I'm literally, I'm your brow. I'm your brow sister. I'm, oh, calm down, calm down, <laughs> trademark. 
I um actually I knew that you were a person from the beginning because my very first class that I ever took was with my friend Lisa Fast, who's out in Houston. She owns Derma Diva something, <laughs> Derma Diva uh, Institute, I think, in Houston. And I took a 100 hour class with her because it was AAM approved at the time. And as I'm sitting there, she pulled out Tina Davies microblades. And she was saying, yeah, you know, these are the ones that we used to use. Now we use Tina Davies. They're a little bit more expensive. So if you're just starting out, there's no shame in the game if you want to use these other ones. And it was like the, you get the the reusable handle that you're supposed to autoclave and then the the little tiny microblade you put in there, you know? Yeah, twist it up. Yeah. She was like, these are better because they're completely disposable and it's got the doe foot on it and whatever, but blah, blah, blah. And I said, oh, okay. Um, so like, this is a brand name. And she said, Yes. Um, Tina Davies has, I don't know, she came out with these, I don't know, August or something like that. It, it wasn't that long because this was in January of 17. So they hadn't been out for very long. And I said, oh, T that's a person. And she said, yeah, Tina Davies, you know, she lives in, I don't even remember what she said and blah, blah, blah. And uh, I said, you know her? And she said, yeah, I know her. You know, I met her at a, at a conference. And I couldn't believe it. Didn't even know who you were. But I'm looking at a very polished, very finished product. And I'm thinking to myself, this is a lot of money. Um, and you know this person? Like you, this is like telling me, you know, the guy who owns Nike, you know, this person. She was like, yeah, everybody <laughs> knows Tina. She's very approachable. I met her at a conference years ago. I couldn't believe it. So I've always known that you were a person, but it's very much the brand is what's represented, right? The brand is what's everywhere. So would you say that's maybe like, I don't know, what's the most common misconception about Tina? That could be about Tina the person or Tina the brand. Um, I don't hear that many, but what I when I do hear something, people when I let's say I'm talking to you now, and during our first combo, people are like, oh my God, you're really easy to talk to. Yeah. I, I'm so surprised you're friendly and approachable. I hear that a lot. So I think that that must be something, you know, but like I yeah. said, I'm, I'm just like you guys, I'm a PMU nerd. I think that's an easy trap to fall into. It's almost like people say like, don't meet, don't meet your heroes. You know, when someone becomes bigger than themselves, you became a whole brand and you're a gigantic part of this industry. You are not Miss Tina Davies. You are the Tina Davies brand, right? Yeah. People can kind of, you become bigger in their brain than the person standing in front of us, which by the way, I don't, Tina, how tall are you? Like five, six? No, I'm five, two. I'm, t I'm petite size. <laughs> I'm five foot. So everybody's tall to me, but I was going to say like, you're not even that much taller than me. She's very small. She's just a lady. Actually, I saw you getting out of, um, uh, I guess a, a van from the airport or something. You were getting all your bags out when we were at... What was the name of that hotel we were at? Fonta Blue. Mm -hmm. And my husband and I were walking to Walgreens. We thought to go and get some alcohol. I didn't realize in other states you have to go to a liquor store. In Louisiana, liquor is at every store. So we were mm -hmm. just like, ah, let's go and get some liquor. This, the prices at this bar are outrageous. And as we were walking, I saw you getting out. And I looked at my husband. And I said, that's Tina fucking Davies. And he was like, who is Tina fucking Davies? <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, even seeing you in front of me and seeing that you are a real person in the flesh who's my height, my size, pretty much. Yeah, I'm, I'm dealing with bags falling over. Like I'm literally, doing... literally, and Brooke yeah. running around. I was like, oh. it was like seeing a celebrity. And I don't really get excited about celebrities, but I was like, oh, look, oh my God, that's amazing. I didn't, you know, I knew you were a real person, but you were kind of a myth in my mind. I feel like that's something that a lot of people buy into, whether they do it on purpose or not. You kind of start to think of someone as, way up there because you see their name brand everywhere. You see the the marketing, the messaging everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. What do, you, for sure. what do you find most difficult about being the mom, being the brand, being the person? Hmm. First of all, the mom guilt just never goes away. Oh, good. That is the hardest part is that guilt. Did you ever talk so to the your only thing you could do is you could temper it. You know, the only thing you could do is you can just balance it out. Like, okay, tomorrow or this weekend, let's go do this kids. And the hardest yeah. part is like, just as an entrepreneur now, like you depend on your phone so much and all this communication, like it's 
all this stuff is always coming in at you all the time. And I think that's such a hard part because you're like, I just need to handle this. And then you were, you're supposed to be at the pool and you're doing this. Yes. Oh my God. You're so right. I'll, I'll be like 30 minute breaks. I'll be like in the pool for 30 minutes and then I'll get out and I'll get them something to drink. And then I'm checking my phone, I'm checking my email. I'm answering someone. What are, you're exactly right. You have, you're in the unique position though, of having parents who were also entrepreneurs. So do you ever like go to them and say, how did you deal with this? Or even sometimes I've heard this from other people, like, even though they didn't apologize, kind of that I forgive you moment, because I see it from your side now, you know, they say, as you become a parent, your parents become humans to you, not just your parents. Like, like in peanuts where they're there. Wah, 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 wah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you ever go to your mom and say like, Hey, how did you deal with this? No, I never asked her. I just saw what they were doing. And I know it was out of necessity. So you have to be very understanding of it. And there's a lot of things that you don't agree with what they do. <laughs> you know, yeah. my kids are not going to agree with what I do. So for, um, for me, I just really try what I want to do different for my parents is carve out that extra time where my parents were like literally working 24 seven where yeah. I'm like, okay, I'm 70, 30. So 70, I'm really focused on the work and 30. It's like, let's have our vacations. My parents, they only took one day off Christmas, one day of 365 days. I have weekends off. So weekends, we still do stuff. Yeah. You know? So I'm what's not your, bad. <laughs> what's your but favorite? This. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, I think we all are kind of guilty of that, whether you run a business or not, people are glued to their phones, especially in 2023. What do you, um, what would you say is your favorite? Hey, let's take the kids and go do this thing. Is there an annual tradition? Is there something that you like to do most weekends? Um, we have a lot of traditions and we do the, the, the like holiday stuff, but, um, for us really, it's just dinner time. It's just like dinner time where we connect. There's no phones. We have very transparent conversations and everyone gets to talk and have a voice. And that was very different from how I was raised. When I was raised, it was like the parents are the boss. Kids have to bl listen blindly and follow and not even like raise any concerns. So yeah. the way I have with my kids is like, we, we talk about everything. My, my 17 year old son still comes to me, hugs me, kisses me. Like there was no affection in my family. There was never even an, I love you. And because of that, there was a lot of distance. So it's, that's just part of being like a different generation. You know, I, I, I just didn't want that to go forward with my, my kids. And I, I that's, know that that's I'm probably, a lot older. That's Pardon? probably also why you don't go to your parents and say, Hey, how did you deal with this? Or, Hey, how should I, or what do you think? What because there's, there's just no precedent for it. Yeah, that makes sense. It isn't. And for me at PMU world live, um, I, I was giving my keynote speech, uh, the next day and I decided I wanted to bring Brooke on stage. And I said, will you come on stage and say something, a few words, because what I wanted to normalize for the women there, a lot of the people there was like, it's okay to involve your family, your kids, and you don't have to feel guilty. Cause I lived with that guilt for so long. And, and I was trying to put my kids in all these camps and, yeah. you know, and, and then to buy them things. Cause then maybe they'll appreciate the gifts I buy them. Cause I work so hard and whatnot, but at the end of the day, they just want to be a part of your life. Yeah. Okay? They want to be involved. They want to be told to like my way, the highway or, you know, or go to camp or like just, so I want to normalize that. So I brought her on stage just to say a few words and to say, it's okay. And I, and I'm bringing her to events because to be honest with you, I mean, all, all us females entrepreneurs, we have kids. And if you could just fold them into your business, if other leaders can show, Hey, I'm doing this. And they're actually getting an incredible education by watching you. Kids don't listen to what you say. They, they watch what you do. You. They watch what you do. Yes. Yeah. Freak. So that's what like, I'm trying to give, um, share that message to like so many female entrepreneurs. It's so it's okay to do that. And don't feel bad. Like forget the guilt. It is what it is. It's not going to change. You're not going to all of a sudden stop and be like, stay at home, mom. You're not, you're just, no. that's not who you are. You won't be fulfilled. No, no. So just fold them in and, you know, you guys get the balance, but it's not a big deal. They what does that look them. like? What does that look like in the future? Are you carving out a place for Brooke in your business 20 years from now? Only if they want to, but for now, 
They're like, you know, help mommy pack these boxes. Help yeah. Mommy, you know, I, I put numbing cream on Brooke's lips the other day. I'm like, try this out. How do you feel? And she's like, you know, she's trying it out. <laughs> so <laughs> I should have given her. What do you think? Uh, you know, I tried on my husband. Try this out. What do you think? Like, give me feedback. Yeah. Yeah. What numbing cream was that? Oh, well, <laughs> I'm going to share it with you once I have it. Hey, why I'm did always you switch? working on projects? I have projects that I have in my back pocket from five years ago. I'm still working on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we all have those, like the idea that haunts you, you know, it's just there, you know, that you have to, you know, action on it. I was just talking to someone about that before you and I hopped on this call, actually someone saying, I, I really thought this was an ace in the hole. I have to bring this to fruition, but a girlfriend of mine told me it was worthless. It's useless. So I don't know. Now I'm having second, second thoughts. And Taryn Darling spoke about that on the first episode of last season's podcast, where she said she had this amazing idea for a, whatever it is, six or eight hour live color theory class, where you can ask Taryn questions in real time. And she's showing you a presentation and somebody told her not to do it. They said, that's a waste of your time. No one is going to want to sit in front of a computer for six or eight hours and talk about color theory. You're wasting your time. I wouldn't even invest in that. And she actually didn't do it for a while. And um, after a year or two, she was like, no, this is killing me. It's in the back of my brain. I have to do it. And of course, it made her more famous than she ever could have been. And it helped more people than ever. Matter of fact, in one of her very first videos, I'm standing there with a baby on my hip going, uh-huh, uh-huh, in one of her first classes. And I sat there for six or eight hours with a baby. You see me feed the baby. You see me change the baby. I'm just, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're just on mute. You're like shouting over there going, oh. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> no, I'm all about that. Chase, you know, whatever the next idea is in your head, chase it down until you decide whether or not it's going to work out. Why did you, you have to? Um, why you did you, know you have to have a lot of um, streams going? Yeah. Because this will drop out. This will drop out. This will not uh, come to fruition. This partner is going to bail on you. And so you always have to have a lot of plates in the air. Don't get me started on partners. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> gosh. Tell me though, why, um, why the swap from I love ink, which is more of a hybrid, right? Yeah. It's now, organic. Yeah. Lot, last long time. Pure organic. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's some, you know, inorganic ingredients in it, but mainly yeah. organic. It stays a long time. And then now we have this idea for fade because earlier you kind of pricked my ear when you said, that's what we need. We need something that's going to stay in the skin, just like tattoo ink. And now we've got fade going on. So how did... Where's the bridge there? What was the thought process? Well, the thing is that I Love Inc. performed so incredibly well that people were not even getting touch-ups after two or three years. And it was lasting too long. And a lot of feedback. This is where we learn so much for product development. We have to rely on the product feedback, right, from artists. Last right. too long. But mainly the reason why I came out with a less- longevity type of line was because my grand vision for the industry is to make permanent makeup the makeup of the future to make it the makeup of the future people often think like oh permanent makeup is so saturated so popular now you know all that but there is at least half of the people sitting on the sidelines at least half that are scared of permanent makeup they're scared of this 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 yeah okay um because it's a tattoo and it They've seen bad jobs and whatnot. So in order to make permanent makeup, the makeup of the future, we need to have, I would say, 80% acceptance of the procedure. Like anybody's like, hey, I'm going to get my hair done, my nails done. So until it is people's, their, their biggest fear is the inflexibility, okay, yeah. the permanence of it. So if we could make it where it's like, hey, it lasts only a few years. And it still looks good. No rainbow eyebrows, okay? No rainbow eyebrows. <laughs> no rainbow. rainbow by Tina, on 2026. And, and see if I like it. See if I like the shape. Then, then we can get people more comfortable with getting it and not being scared of it. So my grand vision is to make permanent makeup, the makeup of the future, and to have the product so good, because that's what lasts in the skin, right? That the products are so good that everyone is now saying, sure, I'll get I'll get it done, just like I get my highlights. People are not doubtful of highlights, but they're very doubtful of this, 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 because they've seen bad jobs. They've seen, you know, 
uh, turn gray. They've seen like bad lips. So yeah. that's my vision. I think we're going to get there in less than five years. So um, fade is my ode to that vision to give the flexibility. There's still I love ink. I love ink is still there for yeah. people that have different needs. I always say I love ink is like getting married, long-term commitment, hard to change, last forever. And then fade is dating. Okay. It's flexible. You could switch it. You can change the shape, change the color. It's not a super long-term commitment. Fades out of the skin to a lighter color in about 18 months. That would be amazing. I think that um, if the in, if industry wide we could tell our clients, hey, this you don't have to worry about it long term. This will be gone if you if styles change, if your preference changes, if your face dramatically changes. Don't worry about it. You can always put on a different color, a different. Because don't we all get those clients who just don't understand? No matter how many times you tell them it's a tattoo, I can't do that. They say, hey. I'm ready for my annual touch up. I just want to let you know I'm a redhead now. Can we change it? Like, no, girl, it doesn't work like that. You have brown, black eyebrows because that's what your brow hair looks like. Yeah, well, I've dyed it red. Can you change? It? No, I can't tattoo red over black. What are you talking about? Yeah. So, yeah, I think that you're really onto something. I'm really excited about it. I haven't tried fade yet, but I need to get some. I think in 2024, I'm going to start using it so that by December or so I can say oh yeah I can see how these look a year out right now I've been kind of waiting for someone to post long-term results I haven't seen them yet but they should be coming up soon because you're almost at a year right yeah that's right and you know um mineral slash inorganic pigments are not new to the industry no They're I've been new. using biotech been, for a while and yeah, I, they've been I like around them. they seem comparable though right yeah they've been around so fade is just like an extension of that option because I have I Love Ink, lasts too long. And also for on the artist side, you're turning clients away. And it's so hard to build the business. And if you don't see your clients for two or three years, that's not recurring revenue. And also that client can kind of wander somewhere else. Yeah. Or forget about it. You know, no, you know what? It took forever for these to fade out before I needed it again. I don't even want to go through it again. I'm not going to bother with it again. Yeah. I am so it's good for everybody. Everybody wins. That way. I'm not taking new clients at the moment. So um, I will be for the for quarter one and that's it. Because otherwise, you know, I'm on the conference circuit. So I, I can't really adhere to a schedule. But I when I am seeing just annuals throughout the rest of the year, I am seeing a big drop off in those, especially in 2023, which was a hard year for everyone. Yeah. But some people saying, you know, I really don't have the, the money right now. Other people saying, I don't need a touch up right now. And I think that was because of you, you bitch. <laughs> because of I love ink. No, it's like a light bulb that never burns out. Yeah. So it was kind of like, okay, well, I'm glad that you're happy with your eyebrows, but I, I have a business to run. So that's when I started looking towards inorganics. And then now that you've come out with this line, I'm very intrigued and very interested in it for sure. I think a lot of people are, but they're kind of just wondering, you know, first, um, it's not through permablend and that's what your original deal was through. So they're, everyone's speculating, is there beef? Is there not beef? Because everybody knows Ruben really yelled at permablend very publicly. And so they're wondering, is it an artist versus permablend issue? And I think the second thing is people saying, okay, well, what's different about this one than other inorganics? Because inorganics have been around for some time. Do you want to yeah. speak to any of that? <laughs> uh, definitely we can go into it. Um, I don't want this to be like a product push or anything. But it's it, if you guys are looking for a solution to offer to your clients, definitely fade is my my ode to a more like temporary, not permanent, permanent solution. Yeah. And as far as permablend goes, like permablend is my partner for now over five years. We work so well together. I didn't we didn't divorce. We didn't break up. There's no ugly thing. Yeah. And if anything, I always develop products with the main goal of the customer's and the customer's needs, and then the artist needs. Always customer's needs first, and the artist needs second, right? Because we work for our customers at the end of the day. Yeah. Right? And as far as like a permablend goes, like I have products with them, but I don't keep all my eggs in one basket. So right. I make products with different manufacturers, you know, whoever can give me the best product. That's what I go with. So let's put that one to rest right now. You heard it here first. Tina Davies, Permablend, there's no beef, you guys. Facebook forums, there's no beef. It's simply just a matter of who's going to make the best product for your clients. Yeah, like I talk to them like almost every day. So 
It no seemed that way when you were and talking really about it earlier. Yeah. And that's one thing that's really important I want to speak to is about business hygiene. Like you've got to have excellent business hygiene, especially like when you're working, you're collaborating with others, you got to, the communication has to be open, honest, tight, and it has to be structured too. Uh, That's one huge transition that I wasn't used to. Like working as an artist, you're kind of working by the seat of your pants. You don't have really tight processes and, and systems. And you're kind of like, okay, yeah, well, do it tomorrow or, you know, it's very loose. And when you're running an organization, you're working with different partners and, you know, you're managing product line, supply chain, logistics and whatnot. Everything has to be organized, detailed, strategized, planned for. Yeah. That's how you get predictability in your business, right? Stability. Yeah. I can appreciate that. And I've, I've certainly um, been watching all the people that I've spoken to on this podcast so far have been successful professionals, right? So, One of the things that I noticed is that some people are still of the entrepreneurial mindset as a, as an artist. And then some people come from the school of business first. And I am kind of neither. I'm really good at just chatting people up and, and making inappropriate jokes at the wrong time. And that's what people like about me. So am I the best artist in the world? No, I'm a pretty good one. I'm not the best. I'm not going up against like fleek brows or something, right? Like I know my lane and I am no Tina Davies. I, I, when you told me like, no, we have to have a pre-meeting. I called Danny Tran crying and I was like, what does this mean? (laughs) He was like, no, Tina just likes things, you know, predictable. So she's going to want to know like, what exactly is the format of the podcast? What can she expect so that she can prep for it? And actually, doesn't that make the most sense? But no one's asked me that so far on this podcast. <laughs> so I, I took notes. I took notes. I said, you know what? That's actually probably a really smart way to do things to make sure that we're not saying like, oh, was that today? Sorry. You know, that kind of thing. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. It happens more often than you think. Yeah, it's more uh, just um, getting organized, really organized. And I've been forced to do that because I paid the price where I wasn't organized. And like my business partner, Luke, my husband, he's always from the beginning, he was always on me. He's like, not everything can be you think. Where's the data? Where's the data to back this up? He's like, where's the proposal? I'm like, okay. (laughs) What was the biggest lesson? What was the biggest one where you were like, okay, yes, I need to get on board with the organizational train? Um, I like doing that. Uh, so the biggest lesson is the more organized, the more prepared, the the more everything is spelled out, the the, the faster you guys are going to row that boat together. Oh, and if you are, that. if you don't, oh my God, twists and turns. And it's so, so much more painful. And then, you know, women, we get very emotional and we get frustrated. We Then we blow up and melt down. Oh, I do. I'm a big blow upper. I, I hold it together for a long, 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 long time. And then I go home and I, I yell at everybody. I just absolutely lose it. And it's not good. Um, but I, you know, nobody will give me any diazepam. So it's the way that things are working for now. <laughs> I'm working on it. But you just, I feel very called out right now. That's exactly right. I get very emotional about it. I have a whole meltdown. I hear our you. Property, I hear you. Property I've been there <laughs> our property taxes came in and I opened it up and I sat down at the kitchen table. It was like a Sunday morning that I opened this and looked at it. And my husband's like going through his He works in the oil field. He builds explosives. So he always has these logs of like how deep down something was when they exploded it or whatever. So he's going through these logs and making his notations and he's a nervous person. So he's very analytical about everything. And I'm always like, everything's fine. I got this. So I opened up the property tax. I was like, (laughs) I'm legally required to give five away. I don't understand how anybody makes money in business. And I'm just going on and on. And I look at my husband in the sheer terror on his face. Like, are we bankrupt? And I was like, no, we're not. I can pay this, but I'm upset right now. (laughs) You are exactly right. No, seriously, men are from Mars and women are from Venus. (laughs) And and we come together some magically magical way to actually make sense. (laughs) That's so funny. Oh my gosh. Well, Tina, are you going to be um, promoting? I'm sure your pro team will be posting these one year healed results shortly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Where should people keep an eye out for this? Instagram on Tina Davies professional. So at Tina Davies professional is the business type of account. And I have my own, which is at Tina Davies. I've got, I'm so busy on the Tina Davies 
portion that I don't really post to my own personal very much. And to be yeah. honest, it's a full-time job. I can't do two full-time jobs anymore. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Um, Tina, real quick, in 2024, where can people see you? Okay, so you know what's happening in North America that I noticed? There's these PMU competitions now. Have you seen that now? Yes. More and more. Well, yeah, I met you at one. Yes. Yes. So um, in March, I'm at um, the Browista competition that's being held literally in South Florida, like Miami. Yep. So I know competition is so daunting, but at the same time, it's a networking opportunity. And, you know, it's a way to kind of like maybe get placed. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll be there. So that's what's what's where someone can see me like in the short term. March. Nice. Miami. Yeah. And don't count those out because listen, I have no business entering any competitions. Okay. I was just a spectator at Woolop and Tina was a judge at Woolop. And look, we're hanging out right now. So you never know what kind of networking can come from that. Guys, go to one event a year. I don't care what it is. Go to one. Right. And you'd be like, wow, so many brow sisters out there. My <laughs> tribe, my people. And you make those connections. It's just not going to happen with you sitting at your studio. It's just not going to happen. People, will, people, they like, know, and trust. And if they don't know you, they're not going to work with you. I agree. Well, yeah. Tina, I now know you and I like you. So I will be seeing you. I don't know if I'll see you in um in March, but I'll be seeing you, I'm sure, sometime this year. Maybe at Christmas conference. Yeah, and to I everyone know else. Yours. Yeah. I just heard about that. I'm like, wow, that's so cool. Yeah. I'm gonna um we're we're planning 2024 right now. So I'll send you some details. Um, but for everyone else who's interested in meeting Tina or seeing Tina and all of her pro team, head over to at Tina Davies Professional or meet her at Browista down in, I think, Miami. Is it Miami? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, in Miami in March. Thank you so much for carving some time out of your very busy day, Tina. I really appreciate it. I know it's not easy ruling the world and the house and setting aside quiet time to chat with me. So I appreciate your time. Oh, you're welcome. It's been a pleasure. So nice to connect with you here. All right, you guys, I will see you next week on the Glam Life Podcast with Danny Tran.